Welcome, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the fifth lesson of the fourth quarter of the Teens Cornerstone Lesson 2023. From the orchestra, we have Sid on the piano, Amy on the violin. And from our wonderful panelists, we have Jabari, Elsie, and Misiti, and our wonderful teens teacher. My name is Mika Fex, and I will be taking you through the mission story. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful day. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we go through this lesson, your will will be done, O oh Lord, and your spirit may come to everyone, and that everyone who's watching may understand. For this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Bringing Father to Church. That is the title of today's story. It talks about a six-year-old girl who loves the Sabbath. Her name is Mefuma. Now, Mefuma loves, loves singing about God. She loves reading Bible stories. And above all, she loves praying to God. But she noticed that her mother was not happy because her father was not in church. He was at home. And she also noticed that the mother was not sleeping very well. She had nightmares at night. Now the father came home and asked, what's wrong? Why don't you sleep well? The mother replied, we might be married, but we're not united. Puzzled, the father asked, what do you mean by this? Mefuma also wondered what mother meant. She said, the mother, despite everything you have provided for me, I am still not happy. At church, we are taught that we should pray together, read the Bible together, and above all, we should go to church together. Now, father frowned and said, it isn't important to go to church together. Mother was very sad, and she did not know what to do. All she could do was cry. Now when Mefuna, Mefuma saw her mother crying, she also became sad. Came to her mother and said, Mother, have you talked to God? The next time Mefuma saw her mother cry, she asked again, Mother, have you talked to God? Hearing this, mother finally prayed to God. And while she was praying, she, she came up with a brilliant idea. She called Mefuma and said, Mefuma, I want you every Sabbath to go tell your father what you learned at church that day. So the first Sabbath she came and she told her father about Abraham, how he was a man of faith and everything God told him to do, including getting out of his home, he did without questioning. The following Sabbath, she also came and told the father about how Jesus was baptized. Two years passed and Mefuma kept telling father what she learned at church. Father still did not come to church. Now, Mefuma reached eight, and she was finally invited to speak at the church. Every children will participate in the children's Sabbath, and Mefuma will preach. She came to her father and invited, her, invited him, and father did come to church. Although he did come late, he still heard the little girl preach. Mefuma spoke to the parents and told the parents, father and mothers, to go and teach the children how to pray. She told the children that they should also be praying for the parents. Now, when they came back home before bedtime, Mefuma came to her father and said, Father, before you go to work, you dress nicely and rush so, you do not be, uh, so you're not late. But when you came, when you invited to church, you did, not come you did not come early and you still did not dress up that night. Then she prayed, Please God, don't give up on my dad. Save us. Amen. Oh, the father was heartbroken, crying. And the next time, he did come to church. And the Sabbath after that, he gave his life to Christ and was baptized. Now the Sabbaths continued and they were very happy. The father, the father and Mefuma all at once. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Seventh-day Adventist school in Mefuma's home country of Cameroon where children will be able to learn about the God who hears prayers. Thank you for planning a generous offering next month.
we're going through lesson five, titled Trading Leaders. And here with me, I have a wonderful panel made up of Mona Lisa to my furthest right, Jabari right next to me on the right. I have Misati next to me on the left, and Elsie Dama at the very end. And uh, I'll begin by asking my brother Jabari to take us through the key text and the what do you think section. Jabari, go ahead. So for the key text, we have two. One of them, First Samuel 8, 19 and 20, which says, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And for the second one, First Samuel chapter 2, verse 7, which says, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. So, for the what do you think section, would you rather depend on how God leads you or on how human culture leads you? Over here we have three examples and for each we should see what God's plan is and man's plan. So for the first, if someone's tempted to re take revenge on someone who has wronged you, so teacher, you know what's God's plan? In the Bible, we read that vengeance belongs to the Lord. In the book of Romans, the Lord will repay. So God's plan would always be for us to commit ourselves to him, like his son Jesus Christ did when he was crucified. Remember the prayer he prayed for the people who crucified him? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So that is the posture for God, and that should be our plan as well. Okay, and man's plan. What's the human attitude towards getting back to someone? I think we're very vengeful at, at our core. What do you think, Ms. Ati? I absolutely agree, because as human beings, it's always that you want to get back that which someone stole from you or how someone wronged you often. So like, how can I suffer alone? No, let's suffer a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah, in the book of John, chapter 3, we read that this is the condemnation of the world. Light has come into the world, but men prefer darkness. And in the case of revenge, men prefer vengeance. But they've always said when you embark on a plan for revenge, dig two graves, right? So it's a very dangerous path as well. Well, for the next example, if you are tempted to gossip, what's God's plan, Elsie? If, if you're tempted to gossip, I think God's plan would to keep away from fellow gossipers and walk in the right path. If you see a group of people, for example, girls, it's common in girls' high schools, during break time or lunch time, you find a group of three girls and they're gossiping. The most, the thing you'd like to do is join them, but what God is asking people to do is to just walk away and pretend they're not there. Find something else to do, something even more constructive than joining them to gossip. Well, for man's plan, I think I can answer that. Well, human beings usually, by nature, we really want to know what someone has done, what's happened. So we really shouldn't. So really, when someone has, as people call it, tea, you really want them to tell you what they Spill do. In it. fact, you can even nag Spill them so that you know. Yeah. Um, Lisa, any thoughts before we move on? Um, sure. Um, I was going through a few Bible verses, and most of them are found in Proverbs mm -hmm. uh, that speak about, like Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse person stirs up conflict and gossip separate close friends. Mm -hmm. uh, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down 
to the inmost parts. They say usually the tongue is the smallest organ of the body, but it's the mightiest uh, weapon. Mm. And the psalmist says in Psalm 141, I believe, um, set a guard on my tongue That's right. and, um, you know, protect. Guard, my, guard the doors of my lips. Mm. That would show God's plan. But as humans, you know, tea is, is sweet when served cold. But that's not what the Bible, or that's not God's plan for those who walk in his footsteps. Amen. Okay, for the last example, we have being tempted to steal something you want but cannot afford. So, teacher Regine, What's God's plan? God's plan when we are tempted to steal is uh, contentment. I think it's Timothy, who was, was a letter by Paul to Timothy, where he wrote, godliness with contentment is great gain. So God's plan is for us to be happy with what he has already given us. And quite honestly, he's given us a lot. Right? If you look at our lives uh, in comparison to the lives of many others, we are privileged. And because of all these graces God has given us, there's no reason for us to desire something that belongs to someone else. So God's plan is always contentment. But it's very hard to be content when our eyes are always looking over the fence. Right? Maybe you guys live in neighborhoods where the walls are too high for you to see. But it's, it's very hard to avoid seeing the prosperity of others. But if you can turn your gaze away from the wealth of others to what God has given you, you won't be tempted to steal. One, one example that comes to mind is the story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph had a dream, right? And him and his brothers were stars. His parents were the sun and moon. And then the stars came down to bow, Right? The, the, whole, the only thing his brothers saw was the bowing parts. They did not recognize they were also stars, right? So we can, we can miss our gifts by comparing ourselves to others. Comparison is the thief of joy. Before you steal, you've been robbed of your own joy. So contentment is God's plan. Wow, and man's plan, is that, would you like to answer that? Uh, so man's plan would be, take it, I'll have it for myself. That is, or you'd actually, you'd find a way of acquiring that good by fraudulent or corrupt means. Because mm. if you really want a thing, and God knows the desire of your heart, that you desire such a thing, God would make a way for you to acquire it by honest means. But of course, the heart is wicked. So if you try and acquire it by your own means, you'll find a way, like, how can I get it from this person? Or if it's impossible, like if you're coveting someone's car and you want that, that car, getting it would be hard, quite hard, unless you kill the person. But then, so in other words, you'd look for corrupt means to acquire that same good. Then the covetousness would kill you and rot you from inside. And I think that's often like the way of men. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. And just to add it, a little wisdom there. Um, it, life is a journey where we learn to develop the ability to pay the price. All right? Otherwise, you'll go through life as a window shopper mm -hmm. with nothing in your bag, right? So yeah. even though we want things, we must ask ourselves, are we ready to pay the price for those things? Because if you are, eventually you will have it. Before we go, to, um, before we go into the story uh, with Misati, let me just say one thing from our key text. Israel's error in asking for a king was forgetting that they already had a king. And in the book of Hosea, chapter 13 and verse 10, the prophet of the Lord says, I will be your king. Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. So this shows us something about God, that God desired to be the king 
over the children of Israel. And he was actually hurt when they asked for, asked for a king because he thought he was their king. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we can clamor for people to lead us, to influence us, but God wants to be the main influencer of our lives. So Misati, please take us into the story. Uh, so jumping right into the story, we look at Samuel and Samuel is anointing Saul. So God had made it clear to Samuel that Saul would be the king. So Saul, Samuel goes up to Saul and takes olive oil and pours it on his head. Then the moment Saul is anointed, Samuel indicates to him that I want you to fulfill very specific instructions. Very specific. So he would go unto Gibeah. Then at Gibeah he would meet three men. The first man would be carrying three young goats. The second man would be carrying three loaves of bread. And the third man would be carrying a skin of wine. So what would happen is that Saul was to be given two loaves of bread and he would accept them. Then after accepting the loaves of bread, he would go even farther. And as he went farther, he would meet some priests. And these priests would be sort of, they were like a band. They had lyres, they had harps, that kind of stuff. So they were like a, a band then Saul would be enjoined to these people and would begin to celebrate and even prophesy. So he would begin to prophesy. Uh, It almost seems like he would start to speak in tongues, maybe. But he would prophesy. He would prophesy with these people and then his heart would be changed. So Saul goes his way and this time, remember we're not yet at the point of the ban of Harem and King Agag. The guy is quite obedient at this point. So he goes out and he follows exactly what God wants him to do, and at that time, the signs are fulfilled in that day, and Saul's heart is changed. Wow. The man's a changed man at the end of that day. Then Samuel goes unto the people and says, I want to bring you all together, gather here. And as they gathered there, they did their things, and the tribe of Benjamin was picked. And um, in the, within the tribe of Benjamin, the clan of Matri was picked. And within the clan of Matri, Saul, son of Kish, was picked. Then people were like, where is Saul? Then it's, it's, it was now made clear, oh, the guy is hiding with the supplies. He's hiding with the food and stuff. He's hiding with the tent gear. Okay, that, that looks a bit sketchy. It's like, why is the king among supplies? Then we will go for him. And then when he enters, everyone stand. It almost feels like they hadn't noticed him before. Maybe he was obscure. But when, they, when he enters in, everyone's shocked. Why? Because he, he was a head taller than even the tallest man there. He was, in essence, a Goliath of, over them. He just looked huge. And people were like, yes, this is our king. Because see, people, we look at the outside. So people were like, yes, this is our king. And then someone asks them, will this man be your king? And he says, yes shall be our king. Wow. It's a fantastic story, guys. So out of the story now, we begin with the second question. What prompted the people of Israel to want a human king? What do you think, Elsie? Um, I think the, the Israelites, first of all, they, there's this thing that my mom normally tells me. When you associate yourself with the world too much, you begin to want what they want. And some people might think that because I'm, I'm relating with them, it's easier for me to save them. But in essence, when you relate to them more, the more you lose the savior's touch. Mm. So the Israelites, when they were among the heathens, they saw that they had kings, but then they, they have no king. They only have maybe judges, and God is the supreme leader. So the more they intermarried with those people, the more they stayed among them, the more they lost focus. And the more they, they, they continued wanting to be like them, they wanted to be like other nations more and more and more until they decided, no, we don't want Samuel as our priest, our judge. We want, we want a real king. Mm. So I think that's what prompted the people of Israel to want a king. Yes, I couldn't agree more. The Bible says, do not be conformed to the world, but be renewed in your mind. And I feel like imitation in many cases is suicide because you deny yourself uh, your own personality 
And it is very true that it is very easy for us to be drawn away by the world. When we look at how they live, we want to be like them, not realizing that we are called to be a peculiar people. Amen. The next question we could uh, ponder over is the second last question. Why was Samuel so specific in the instructions that he gave to Saul? Manolisa, what do you think? Thank you for the question. Um, Samuel was acting on behalf of God. And from the very onset, even in the Garden of Eden, we see God as a God of order. He's always very specific with the instructions he gives. To, to Adam, he said, um, do not eat from this specific tree in this specific location. And through when you go even with Abraham and um, the building of the tabernacles, it was specific even up to the curtain that was supposed to be in the temple. Mm -hmm. It shows how, how much God is a God of order. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, Solomon was acting on that premise that my God is a God of order. There's a way he likes to do his things and we have to keep his instructions to the latter. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And lastly, um, in what ways do you think Saul had what it took to lead a group of people? In what ways did he not? Misati. So the way I see he had the capacity to lead people was with his tenacity, the way he would always pursue things to the very end. The particular story that stands out in my mind is a time where his father's donkeys were lost. Mm. And what he did is he went out and he searched for those donkeys and never stopped until he found the donkeys. That sort of like endurance, perseverance, going for exactly what he needs, that's a positive thing as I see it. But now on the flip side, if I look at the tests that Saul was subjected to, I, I can see here that maybe he had an issue following instructions to the latter, like specific instructions, he had an issue. Because if you remember the time of the king of Agag, he goes, he surveys, he's like, I have fat animals, I have thin animals. This king, we can keep him alive to torture him a bit. Let's keep people who look okay, who look nice. And at that point, he was like, God, maybe you never meant everyone. You know, it's like, it's not everyone, just the ones who look like this. They don't look that nice, but the animals that don't look as well. So I think that's, that's one issue he had. He was not able to like follow instructions to the latter. Yeah. Wow. I would say in the ways in which he did not um, have what it takes to lead is that he cared too much about people. He was a people pleaser. And um, there's a quote I love by Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill. If we displease God, does it matter who we please? And if we please God... Does it matter who we displease, right? So I think that's a lesson we can take from here. Don't be a people pleaser. And we know that is how our politicians roll. You know, that's how our celebrities roll, but that's not how children of God are supposed to be. Maybe we can read one punchline and then move on to the quotes from Patrick's and Prophets. Jabari, please read us the last punchline, First Chronicles 29 verse 9. And it says, the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given them freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Amen. This is wonderful. The people rejoiced because of the giving of their leaders. Leaders have an impact on us that is so powerful and vast. Uh, the sins of the great command imitation, and so do their virtues. So whenever you guys end up in leadership positions, even those who are watching, if you end up in a position of leadership, remember that people are following you and the example you give will follow them through life. Two major sins that appear in uh, this story are envy, jealousy, and pride. Elsie will take us through Tuesday and Thursday that highlight these two sins. Elsie. All right, maybe before we proceed there, I wanted to add on on the second last question we did. Why Samuel was so specific on the instructions he gave to Saul. Imagine um, 
you've been anointed by God, yes? And then someone tells you everything that is going to happen in the minutes to follow. You might, first of all, I think, okay, I've read somewhere that Saul, before he was anointed, was not, um, I don't know how to say this, but he was not in Jesus fully, like he was not fully converted. And so when Samuel gave him those instructions afterwards and he saw them to actually come to pass, he was like, Enyewe, ni mungu ndi amenyeke, oh sorry. Enyewe, it's God who's anointed me. So it was, it was yeah. a way of affirming Saul and telling him, yes, it is you, you are the chosen one. And then when all those things happened, he went on to prophesy and dance with those guys in a kind of celebratory mood that all these things have happened and anyway, it's God who's done it for me. Yes. Amen. Now to the Tuesday part. Um, I'd like Jabari to read for us Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. Proverbs? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. Let me jump in because I, I find this very fascinating. That a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Ah, interesting. Let's, let's, let's dig deep. All right, so the flashlight section gives us some insights from inspired commentary on the text we have been studying. Now, Ellen White uses a few words that are interesting, jealousy and envy, and these are the first two that jump off the page. Do these words have any meaning in your life? As a woman, and I know women can be very jealous of each other, even in school, like whatever happens to you, you get a good grade, there's always that girl at the back of the class who's just like, I funny, she thinks now she's the best just because she got a 19 cam. Or when you're elected into the student's government, they're all hating on you. So jealousy and envy, as a woman, I, I, it, 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 is, it is part and parcel of my life. So Eugene, what do, what do you think? Yeah, envy is ignorance, I've heard it said. And um, it is because when we are envious, we do not see ourselves in the blessings that God has given us. And then also, envy is natural to all men. Everyone has envied. Envy is as early as three and two. If you want to see envy, just put two kids in a room, take one toy and give it to one of the kids. Before long, World War III happens, right? Yeah. Envy is innate, so we all need help with envy. And I think the, the, the best way to overcome envy is to acknowledge it and to celebrate people, even when it hurts. All right, we just had a wedding here, um, and I'm sure there were people in the crowd picturing themselves on the podium, right? Rehearsing their vows even though they don't have a ring yet. And that's okay as long as after the wedding you compliment the bride and groom and congratulate them. It's very hard to congratulate people, especially when you want what they have. But here's the thing, God will often give you, give someone else what you want before you to test you. And it will often put you under someone who you're going to replace, like David was put under Saul. So it's usually a test. Yeah. Amen, amen. Um, to the next question, to the next two questions. Have you ever asked for things out of jealousy or envy? And have they, have they ever been the motivating factor in purchasing something or saying something or looking or acting in a certain way? Wow. Is that? And those, those are like really loaded questions. Like asking, I think I think I have just like I see someone with something. I'm like, I would really want that thing. Like, I I really really want it. Like nothing's jumping to memory like, immediately, but yes, I am so sure I've ever asked for something. Yeah. yeah. So is it is it a good time to ponder what motivates us to do the things we do? But usually a negative outcome occurs when we do something out of jealousy and envy, and I can always testify of this. Anything you do out of a bad motive will always go southwards, no matter how hard you try to make it appear as if, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an angel, and I'm just wishing them well. But if, if 
if you're jealous or if you're envious in your heart, it always comes out in the end. I don't know how, but it, it just does. And even to use that very same analogy of where you, gi- you put two kids in a room, give one a toy, I think envy is where one kid is like, why them? That's, that's envy. Although now being happy for someone is like, could we play together? That's right. It's like, it's great you have the toy. Now, are you open for us sharing the toy? I respect the ownership of the toy. I'm happy you have the toy. So I'm like, could we play together with the toy? I think that's, that's like overcoming envy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Any thoughts, guys? I see you guys nodding, but <laughs> deep in thought. Well, I was just thinking about like what usually happens with iPhones, right? Wow. You know, you find someone with maybe even an iPhone 14. Months later, they've bought the 15. And it's just months later, and the iPhone 14 is perfectly fine. Yeah. The only reason why they're buying it is because mm. they've either seen someone with it or they want the status from having that yeah. thing. I didn't even know that they were at 14. They left me at yeah. 10. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, that's true. We live in a very materialistic culture where we buy things because other people have them, not because we need them. Mm-hmm. So that is very true, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, does, when you act on something, or um, to the question, the motivating factor of something, or you looking or acting a certain type of way. When you look or act that specific way, does it have to come out of envy or it could come out of, um, you know, a wish, Mm. sort of um, mentorship or motivation, sort of? Is it possible to wish something for yourself without being envious or jealous of those people? Yes, it is possible. Paul tells us in the book of Corinthians, covet the best gifts. Right? So it is possible to covet something without a motivation of envy. Envy is not wanting the other person to have it. See someone with really nice hair, you're like, I wish they didn't have the hair. That's envy. All right? Admiration is getting the same hairstyle and saying to people, I saw it first with, she motivated me to, you know? So that is better. Envy is when you don't want them to have it. That's that's pretty bad. Thank you, guys. Um, On to the Thursday section. Um, If you have the book or a computer available, you can read the chapter 60 of Patrick's and Prophets. Mm. And here you will see that there are many mistakes and character flaws that King Saul exhibited during his reign. One of them was during his pride, or in his pride, he ordered his son Jonathan to be killed. Now what happened is that um, when, the Phili- when the Israelites were fi- fighting against the Philistines, and the Philistines were in a certain plain, yes? And Jonathan and his umbrella had gone to, to, um, to kind of conquer. And they had started to conquer because Jonathan, because John, I mean, sorry, because God was with Jonathan and he had given him victory to some extent. And then when Saul saw this, he also took his army and said, we let us go and to Zambarize, like to just go and finish everything. And he went, when they went there, they, well, they did wonders. They killed and killed and blood and flesh and everything. It was very messy. And Saul was angry, and he said that, I don't want my army to eat. Now, this was out of selfish ambition, because he was saying that, I don't want my army to eat, because after, after doing all those things, it's not right for us to just plunge into eating. It's, it, it was kind of uh, glorifying himself and his army. It was not to glorify God. It was to glorify himself to kind of punish his army, mm. saying that we could have done better, so you're not eating until I say so. So he stabbed them for a day. And after, after starving them, um, he allowed them to eat. And what, what Jonathan did not know was that he, Jonathan didn't know that his father had told people not to starve. So he, he was walking around in the desert and he, he saw, a, what do you call this, the honey? Honeycomb. Honeycomb, yes. Mm. So he, he takes honey and then, okay, this is a bad word. 
Ananyoksiwa. Okay, it's not a bad word. This is the, <laughs> can't find the English yeah. equivalent. Oh, he was snitched on. Yeah. Because someone snitched on him. Someone snitched on him and said, oh, I'm going to tell on you to your father. You, you took honey. So the, that person goes and tells the father, and then the father is like, ah, my son. But you know, he can't go back on his word because he's very proud. He wants to show people, yes, when I say things, I mean them. He says, kill my son, because my son went against my word. But then people were very, they loved Jonathan more than, and I say they loved Jonathan more than lo- they loved so, but Wali, Wali Mtata, they said, no, don't do that to him. Or, you know, he didn't know, he did it out of ignorance. So in his pride as King Saul, he should have been sober enough to be like, okay, he didn't know. Do I have to kill him? No, I don't have to kill him. But in his pride, because he wanted to, to show himself, to show himself to people, he had to say, oh, I am the real OG, whatever I say is done. So in his pride, he exhibited a lot of pride in that moment. Now, when we continue with this part, it says you should have already thought about these characteristics you have that would make you a great leader. Now, take some time to think about these aspects of your character that are not so great. And what can you do to eliminate those character traits that you might have been so that you might be effectively more, sorry, so that you might be used more effectively by God. So it's just, it's a self-reflection. You know your strengths, right? Everyone knows their strengths here. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you're, I don't know, you know, you know yourself. For me, I know myself, you all know ourselves. But you also know your weaknesses, those things that you, you're afraid of letting other people know about or the things that plague your mind in the night in bed and you're wondering well, how will I get over this and you know them and you know that they can make you not be a great leader if you want to be a leader or they can become an obstacle for you from getting into heaven so it's, it's a self-reflection mode yeah. so you know yourself think about it pray to God about it, prayer helps I can testify so it's you look into yourself and you ask God to help you through this because heaven is real. Wonderful, wonderful. I didn't want to stop you, man. <laughs> wonderful. Um, yeah, just to close off, um, we have to be careful not to be around people who make us feel like we always have to prove ourselves. I feel like Saul had a lot of yes men around him and the pressure that was put on him to prove himself made him to make blunders. We see the same blunder done by Herod in the New Testament where he asks for John the Baptist's head because he didn't want to go back on his word. So we should be very careful about the people we put around us because they can lead us to serious sin. And then in thinking about our weaknesses, later on we'll see Saul spare Agag. And I think the lesson is sometimes we can spare a little sin in our lives that ends up being the weakness that brings our leadership down. One of the quotes I love is by Murray McShane. He says, the greatest gift I can give to my people is my personal holiness. And that applies for a pastor, for a CEO, for a mother, a wife, a father, a husband. The greatest gift you can give to your people as a leader is your personal holiness. Because when they fall from such a height, the fall is great. But when they succeed, the success trickles down to all the people who are being led. So as we close, maybe you can have a final word from all of us, and then I'll close with a prayer. If you have a final <laughs> word, that is, you don't okay. have to have one. Thank you. Um, from, from, from lesson five, I learned three aspects. Um, one, as Christians... Sometimes we, we take the value of God's humanity or the value of God's love in our lives that we miss his divinity. Mm. And two, uh, despite the trenches that we dig for ourselves, God will still come down there with us if we but call on him. The idea is to recognize that I have fallen short and I need to call on God. Mm. He'll take away that rejection that you, that you made and change your life awesomely. And the most important thing is when our prayer, when prayer becomes a habit in our lives, 
miracle becomes a lifestyle. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Well, okay, what I've gotten from this discussion is that envious people will always end up somehow leading someone else into envy mm -hmm. because, let's say, for instance, you really want maybe a phone. It's just a phone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you finally get it, you're over the moon, yeah? And you want everyone to know that you have that phone. So whenever you put it in your pocket, you make sure it's in the smallest <laughs> pocket, camera up, so everyone knows it's an iPhone. So out of that, you actually make some, sometimes it's even obvious that this person is trying to show off. They even point to places with their phone, like, yeah, but, uh, well, out of that showing off, people will obviously also want that phone now. Mm. And when they get it, they'll be doing the same thing as you are. Because if you look at really wealthy people who built their wealth justifiably, they're not very showy people. The people who are showy are the people who you hear in debt, or you have, they have problems with, tax institutions, yeah, but if whatever you have is not out of envy, it will be better for you and for other people. Mm. Because if you're not showing off, people have nothing to be jealous about when it comes to you. That's fire. If you're not showing off, people have nothing to be jealous about, yeah. I'd look at the, I'd look at the richest men in the Bible one thing I end up noticing is that these, these were not men who bragged a lot. Mm. These were typically very humble men who knew how to use their wealth for beneficial means. Then I look at Job, I look at Abraham, and I look at the whole range, and I'm like, you know, Job was a very humble man. The guy had a nice life, but he was very humble because he judged with the integrity was credible, he was honest, as in he even went to the degree of saying that, may God smite me if I did not, if I in any way denied the poor something that I could have given or that I did not strengthen the weak in me. Mm -hmm. I think those are the people who we should model after. Wow. Um, for me, I'm just going to, as a prayer, to ask God to not give me too much that I forget who he is and not to give me too little that, that I, I forsake him and say, oh, you Jani Chunga, so me, I'm, I'm also not going to start worshiping you, so I just can go. So for me, I'm just going to ask God, even I hope he has great things for me in the future when I rise there in leadership positions, that I don't let the power and the pride change me. Instead, even in those places of, I don't know, power and might, that I may still remember him and thank him for all that he's done for me. Um, yeah, as a prayer, because I'm, I'm not scared. I just, I've seen too many people get changed by power. So mm. hopefully, thank you in advance, God. Wow, yes, that's a brief prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for orchestrating this meeting in your providence. May the lessons we've learned remain with us for the rest of our lives, and may they bless many others. For Jesus' sake, and in Jesus' name we pray.